On the outskirts of London, at Teddington, stands the National Physical Laboratory. Its newest achievement is the ACE, the protégé of a group of mathematicians. The name comes from its initials, Automatic Computing Engine. Some jaunty news from December 1950. The headlines are dominated by the ongoing North Korean War, but at the National Physics Laboratory, the staff have something to be jolly about. To engineers and scientists in all branches of industry, the electronic brain, as some persist in calling it, will be an invaluable aid. Months of work will be reduced to minutes, thanks to the ACE. Anyone who'd been paying attention to the BBC back in 1946 already knew all about the ACE machine and its origins. For a long time, mathematicians have been occupied in getting better logical foundations for their subject. And in this field, about 12 years ago, a young Cambridge mathematician by name Turing wrote a paper which appeared in one of the mathematical journals in which he worked out by strict logical principles how far a machine could be imagined which would imitate the processes of thought. The answer can't be given simply, of course, but it's roughly that you could make a machine do anything which can be called rule of thumb. The distinguished tones of the head of the National Physical Laboratory, Sir Charles Darwin, the other one's grandson, they're summarising one of the greatest leaps of mathematical imagination of all time. With computers now so ubiquitous, it's hard to imagine just how ace Alan Turing's ace machine looked to be, if it could be built. It was an idealised machine he was considering, and at the time it looked as if it would be so fantastically elaborate that it could never possibly be made. But the great developments in wireless and in electronic valves during the war have quite altered the picture, because through complicated electric circuits you can do many more things at enormously greater speed than you could do before mechanically. Today, the Pilot Ace machine has long been dismantled and few computers survive from those early days. And the National Physical Laboratory has changed character. Jack Copeland, there are a few people more enthusiastic about Turing, is in search of the room where the Pilot Ace was originally built. It's a beautiful room. Uh, high ceiling, lots of windows and you can almost feel the ghost of the pilot ace here. Um, we know from photographs where they built it. And there's a classic photograph of the pilot ace. There are these huge windows in here. And there's the pilot ace standing there in all its glory with sunlight streaming in through the windows. And it, it's like, you know, the, the light comes bursting in. Turing has created the information age and here is the computer. And it's a wonderful picture. So here it would have been, the Pilot Model Ace ran its first program in 1950. Alan Turing is now known primarily for his code-breaking work at Bletchley Park during the Second World War. But like many mathematicians, I first came across him because of his extraordinary insights into machine thinking. It was actually during a university class that I took on artificial intelligence when I first discovered his famous 1936 paper. In this, he laid down the foundation that's now used in all modern computers. Born on June 23, 1912, his mathematical prowess was already emerging while he was still at school, as described by historian Jack Copeland. It was at Sherburn School, the, the first flashes of Turing's mathematical genius started to show. So he'd have been about 16 or something at this time. His maths master was Canon Donald Epperson, who died a few years ago. Epperson says that his methods were sometimes brilliant, but sometimes unsound and that Turing would sometimes take very long-winded approaches to problems because he liked to work things out for himself. And this, this was a feature of his work right through his life. He'd start from first principles and he'd devise his own methods from the ground up. So that tendency was becoming apparent at Sherburn. Another of his masters said that he would donate a billion pounds to charity if Turing passed his Latin exam. <laughs> After school, Turing then studied maths at Cambridge University, and here he very quickly established himself as a brilliant mathematician. By age 22, he was already a fellow at King's College, and he'd begun producing his seminal works about computing and the very foundations of mathematics. He got the ideas as a result of going to lectures by Max Newman, who later, of course, became one of his greatest friends and who he worked with closely at Bletchley Park and then at Manchester. But in 1935, Turing went along to Newman's course of lectures on the foundations of mathematics. 
very difficult subject. So Newman didn't have that many students, but Turing was amongst them. Newman talked about the amazing discoveries recently made at that time by the young Austrian logician Kurt Gödel at the University of Vienna. And the whole course really sort of aimed at an exposition of Gödel's incompleteness results in mathematics. Mathematics is all about what you can logically prove, and Gödel had recently managed to show that regardless of how hard mathematicians work, there's always going to be some true statement that they simply cannot prove. What Turing did was take Gödel's approach and extend it one step further to cover computation. He started to look not just at what mathematical concepts you can't prove, but at the possibility that there are even numbers that you can't compute. As Ian Stewart explains, Turing had reduced arithmetic to its most basic computations. What is a computation? What things are computable? Alan Turing came up with a mathematician's version of a computer, which is called a Turing machine. It's not really the sort of machine that you make. It's the sort of conceptual machine that has all of the ingredients in the simplest way. Ian Stewart explaining what Turing's big breakthrough was. To imagine and describe a machine that could do any computation using only a processor and some memory. So Turing's idea for the memory is it's just an infinitely long tape, well a finite tape, you can make it as long as you like, it's like a tape in a tape measure, but it's divided off into squares, and each square has either a naught written on it or a one written on it. You could do it with magnetic tape if you wanted to. Then you have to have essentially a way of inputting into the machine what you want it to do, and you have to have some sort of processing device which will carry out the instructions. So the kind of instructions Turing had in mind would be things like move the tape one step to the left, look at what's written in that resulting square. If it's a naught, turn it into a one. If it's a one, turn it into a naught. Move three spaces to the right, look at the next square that you find, and so on. And so a program an algorithm for calculating things, a recipe for calculating things, would be a long list of very simple instructions. And mathematically, what's nice here is that although the list of instructions may be long, the actual range of instructions themselves is fairly short. There's a limited set of instructions you're allowed to use. It's not a practical device for exactly the same reason. But nonetheless, what Turing showed very convincingly is anything that any kind of computational device can perform can be done by a Turing machine. Turing's breakthrough was more than proposing a glorified calculator that was just faster than humans. He was redefining the very basis of computation and the notion of one machine that could compute anything. The way people had thought about calculation before Turing had separated categories that he showed should not be separated, that they were really different ways of looking at the same stuff. Logician Martin Davis. Hardware, software, data. In Turing's machine, the hardware of a machine that it was imitating suddenly became software and, in fact, was data to the universal machine. And modern computer science just seamlessly uses this kind of fluidity all the time so that things that nowadays we take for granted, that word processing is a kind of computation, that manipulating a photographic image to get rid of red eye is a computational process. People didn't think that way at all in the 1930s. His proof that there exists in principle a single computational device that all by itself can be programmed to do any computation. That was a radical discovery, and the challenge to see if it could be practically implemented was just then sitting there on the, on the table. Can we do this? The drift from just theoretically proving that a universal computing machine was possible to actually seeing if he could build one started when Turing moved to work at Princeton University in the US in 1936. One of the things that Turing did, not that long after he wrote that paper, when he was in Princeton, the Palmer Physics Laboratory on the campus is adjacent to the old Fine Hall building where the mathematics department was in those days. He would go over to the Palmer Physics Lab and 
borrow equipment and whatnot, and what he was doing was building a binary adder. He was always interested in practical matters. Before he could build his binary adder, the most basic of computing devices, effectively the atom of a computer, the Second World War had broken out and Turing was called away to serve his country in Bletchley Park in their code-breaking division. Here he turned his mathematical skills to breaking the Germans' Enigma cipher and providing a way out of one of Britain's greatest wartime problems. Churchill's advisers were telling him in June 1941 that Britain was just a few months away from starvation. Britain absolutely depended on supplies that were coming across the North Atlantic from America and Canada. And the U-boats were sinking the ships. And they were sinking them so fast that Britain was in danger of being starved into defeat. If Turing hadn't broken U-boat Enigma, then the war might have gone very differently. It was in June 1941 that Turing and his team in Hut 8 at Bletchley Park began reading U-boat messages in real time. They were breaking the daily traffic. So that was the same month Churchill was being told that the submarines were just about to bring Britain to her knees. So Turing broke North Atlantic U-boat Enigma just in the nick of time. And the intelligence that they got from Turing's decrypts, Hut 8's decrypts, was so effective that for the first 23 days of June, the U-boats didn't sight a single convoy. It's a remarkable figure, I think. So Turing absolutely turned the balance of the war. During the war, Turing suddenly had the resources and the pressing application to build a computing device and use it to crack the German ciphers. Unfortunately, this hands-on era of Turing's career occurred entirely during the war, deep under the Official Secrets Act. When actually building a computer was explored after the war, Turing was still only known as a theorist. Most of NPR didn't know that he'd been involved in this code-breaking work during the war. Nobody knew about it, nor would he ever speak to anybody about it. As Turing's colleague Mike Woodger recalls, thankfully, a select few people at the National Physical Laboratory did unofficially know what Turing could bring to this project. The people who knew were in the Secret Service and high up in government, and Walmersley was uh, one of those who knew, knew Alan Turing. So he persuaded Alan Turing to come to NPL when a new division was set up for numerical work. That was what they spoke of, because everyone could speak about numerical work. What they couldn't speak of was why Turing was so appropriate to lead a team doing that work. Moreover, his qualifications included experience of electronics. And again, nobody knew at that time that there was going to be an electronic computer. That was just not mentioned. Until 1946, the year I joined in May, in February, a complete description by Alan Turing was put before the executive committee of the NPL, and they approved it a month later to build an electronic computer. Historians comment on how specific Turing's proposal was for a computing machine. Unbeknownst to most people at the time, Turing had already seen electronic calculators working during the war, such as the Colossus that was built to crack Hitler's Lorenz code. Knowing what already worked, Turing wanted to go one step better and build a machine that was far more flexible. There will be positively no internal alterations to be made. Even if we wish suddenly to switch from calculating the energy levels of the neon atom to the enumeration of groups of the order 720. It may appear somewhat puzzling that this can be done. How can one expect a machine to do all this multitudinous variety of things? The answer is quite simple. Namely, carrying out orders given to it in a standard form which it is able to understand. For all their calculating circuitry, Turing knew that the wartime calculators lacked the electronic memory to truly be universal Turing machines. They weren't computers yet. They simply weren't flexible enough to do different calculations. So, knowing that all the processor circuitry would work, what they first turned their mind to was developing electronic memory. And to modernize, what they came up with looks most unusual. They built giant pipes full of liquid mercury. Whoa. I don't know that I can pick that up. It's extraordinarily heavy. This is a mercury delay line. It's essentially a, a metal pipe. It's about five feet long. It's heavy. It's full of mercury, which is why it's so heavy. 
and it stored pulses of sound. There were beeps going down this tube. The frequency was too high to hear. A bat or a dog or something would have been able to hear them, but we couldn't. They were supersonic as far as we were concerned. And that was the first computer memory. The bits, the zeros and ones, were stored in the memory as pulses of sound. Um, Turing was very excited in 1945 because he thought that this was a way of storing a thousand bits, he said, for just a few pounds. So it was no USB flash drive, but they were in the game with this, this new device. It was going to solve the computer memory problem. If only it was so easy. In practice, the Mercury delay lines were plagued by practical problems. For help building them, the National Physical Laboratory turned to the Postal Service Research Center at Dollars Hill, about 12 miles away. This allowed Turing to get out his running shoes. He was a long distance runner. He was on the short list for the marathon in 1948 when the Olympics were here. Turing's colleague Tom Vickers, who was recorded by the National Physical Laboratory earlier this year. He would run to Dollis Hill from meeting with the post office and uh, often get there before we got there by public transport. Turing, of course, was a, uh, a long-distance runner. Harry Husky, who joined the National Physical Laboratory in 1947, had direct experience of Turing's long-distance running, as recorded in a 1976 interview for the Science Museum. And so the day came when he and I were to go up to Dallas Hill to visit the delay line activity there. And so he, he said, well, he would run up and would I carry up his clothes in a bag that he would give me and I could go up in the train. Well, it's, uh, it's a fairly even competition because to go up in the train, you have to go halfway into London and transfer and go around on a circular route and transfer again. And it turned out I didn't beat him by more than 10 minutes. The exercise alone wasn't enough to keep Turing happy as he was watching other people build his machine. He didn't get on well with the director. He wanted to do things himself with his own soldering arm. Oh no, said the director. We ask officers like you to produce the ideas. We have contractors to do the constructing. Turing was absolutely livid at that. Turing might well have been thinking too far ahead of the people who were building it. But lots of effort was made in getting something built by cooperation with others, and others were a bit reluctant to cooperate. So progress during those two years was disappointing. We could see progress being made in Cambridge and in Manchester, where they'd organise themselves in-house much better than NPL could. In 1948, Turing went back to Cambridge while, at the same time, a team building a competing computer at Manchester University were racing ahead. Today, if you go to the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, you can see a rebuilt replica of this original computer. When I went there, I met Bernard Richards, who was Turing's last student, and Chris Burton, who organised this rebuild, and he gave me an insight into why the original Manchester team had completed their computer so quickly. Bear in mind, it was immediately after the war, and the principal, three principal engineers had come from telecommunications research establishment in Malvern, where they'd been the experts on circuit techniques for radar. Yep. So they, they knew the component, and knew everything they wanted, and Freddie Williams, Having left TRE, been recruited to be Professor of Electrotechnics here at the university, when he left, did a good deal and he had free access to the stores at Malvern. So things like this metal work, these would be standard parts used at Malvern for doing experimental electronic work radar. It's all very repurposed radar, telecommunications oh, yeah, it's, bits. It's, yes, I mean, electronics is putting together standard parts. So, so it was a very much a sort of do-it-yourself as you go along sort of job. Just, Sorry, just remind us, Chris, the time from beginning to end. They brought up some equipment from Malvern in January 1947. They'd already started on the memory system and they were able to store one binary digit at that point. So they came with a bunch of equipment and essentially Tom Kilburn was working full-time on it. Freddie Williams was trying to run the department in parallel. And um, by October of 47, that's within nine months, they were storing 2,000 digits. So they were, during that nine months, they were building it up. It wasn't from, complete. From one to 2,000 yes. bits. Again, it was the computer memory that was critical. And in Manchester, they realized that an image on a cathode ray TV screen will actually persist for a short period of time. And so, can be used to store ones and zeros. 
They'd already had a decent amount of success with this, but they didn't have a computer to actually put their new memory into. Our primary objective was to make a computing machine because a store, as a store, is a useless object. It has to be used for something. The question of whether it is suitable for use in a computing machine can only be established in one way, and that is by using it in a computing machine. Freddie Williams, head of the Manchester Project, again from the archive interviews done by the Science Museum in the 1970s. So as soon as we got the cathode ray tube stores working something like reasonably, we switched our effort to um, building what we called our baby computer. Now let's be clear before we go any further that neither Tom Kilburn nor I knew the first thing about computers. Now we're very fortunate in this respect because we had in the university here Professor uh, Newman and indeed uh, Newman had already got uh, a grant from the Royal Society to build a computer but had not in fact uh, yet embarked on the problem and Newman uh, explained the whole business of how a computer works to us. It took him, I think, all of half an hour. So we uh, went away and decided to build one. Jack Copeland thinks that half an hour is probably underplaying it, and more likely than not, Max Newman student Ellen Turing was quite heavily involved. Possibly the mathematicians had somehow offended the electrical engineer's pride. Tom Kilburn himself, there was a terrible personality thing between him and Turing. And Tom Kilburn, even through gritted teeth, he wouldn't give credit to Turing. And if, if you asked him, uh, well, Tom, where, where did you actually get the idea of a computer from? He'd say something like, oh, well, in 1946, 1947, somehow I got the idea of a, of a stored program computer, but I really can't remember how I got the idea. <laughs> But actually, there's no mystery about where he got the idea from. He went to Turing's lectures. Williams sent him off to Turing's lectures. Kilburn sat there. He was a very good pupil. And he very quickly went from a position of almost total ignorance to uh, being able to design a stored program computer of his own. He was a brilliant engineer, of course. He'd worked with Williams on radar during the war. Between the two of them, there wasn't much about electronic engineering that they didn't know. You know, they were the two guys to build the first computer. There's no doubt about that. They were both brilliant engineers. Now with a working computer and functioning electronic memory, all that was needed was to write some programs to run on it, as described by Tom Kilburn in 1998 on the 50th anniversary of the baby computer being switched on. That program had no mathematical significance. I chose a, a very simple mathematical operation, which is to find the highest factor of a number. That is because that with that program, I could use all the instructions which we'd built into the machine. And so it was demonstrating that the memory which we'd invented worked and the computer worked. Soon after Tom Kilburn's program, another one, handwritten out and sent through the post, arrived from Cambridge. Shortly after the baby computer first ran a program correctly on the 21st of June 1948, Turing had obtained a copy of the instruction code of the machine and had written a program himself to run on the baby machine. And, and this program took every one of the 32 store locations in the machine and was intended to perform a long division. He sent the program, just a list of instructions on a piece of paper, he sent that to the engineers working on the baby machine and Jeff Tootill was given the task of seeing whether this program would run. Jeff says that he tried it and it didn't work and he scrutinised the program for some time, saw that there was a small error and corrected that and then the program did run. Turing was soon in Manchester himself, newly appointed to the maths department. His role there was to write the first ever operating system for the now fully fledged Mark I computer. While Turing was writing programs in Manchester, the pilot ACE, based on his original plans, had finally been built at the National Physical Laboratory. In 1950, it was switched on for the first time. From what we know, Alan Turing never actually went to see his completed ACE, but it turns out you can. Most of it has survived and now resides at the Science Museum in London under the careful, watchful eye of Tilly Blythe. Well, this is Pilot Ace Computer. This is the machine that Turing designed in 1946. 
It has a console that's very much hand-built, is made of wood, various toggle switches and dials, and then the main processor for the machine, which is hundreds of glass valves. The Pilot Ace machine may not have been built quickly, but it certainly ran fast. Mm. I mean, the interesting thing with the Pilot Ace machine was it really was pushing technology to the boundaries. And this really was one of the fastest machines of its time. For a short period, it was one of the fastest computers in the world. Even before they'd been built, in his normal fashion, Turing was already looking ahead to possible applications of computers and even their potential use in research. This is why I first came across him in my cognitive science class when we were looking at programming and artificial intelligence. In his own words, from 1946. In working on the ACE, I am more interested in the possibility of producing models of the action of the brain than in the practical applications to computing. Alan Turing's work on artificial intelligence actually started a whole new area of research, and his work is still studied to this day. Yet another astonishing contribution to science from a man who'd already achieved so much. We can only guess what he would have discovered next, because his tragic death in 1954 robbed us of this amazing talent. What we do know for sure, though, is that his passing provoked very little comment at the time, something that still despairs historian Jack Copeland. I don't think much attention was paid to his death. It wasn't that there were headlines saying national treasure dies at the age of only 41. Nobody really knew what he'd done. His work at Bletchley was completely unknown. In terms of war heroes, who do you think of? Churchill, Eisenhower... And then it's got to be Turing, you know, he's sort of up there amongst the top names in terms of the contribution that he made. You know, his breakthroughs were absolutely crucial in the Battle of the Atlantic. And then there was this whole other side of his life. He also invented the store program computer. But again, nobody really knew this. So no one really appreciated the significance of Turing's 1936 paper in the history of computing. So he was a, a national hero on two fronts. If people had known what Turing had done during the war, when he died, there'd have been a state funeral, maybe even to rival Churchill's state funeral. But there was just nothing. No one knew. He was an insignificant figure, this strange, eccentric doctor who died in Manchester, and he had something to do with this funny thing called an electronic brain. It was of really... No national interest whatsoever. Should have been.